Hello, and welcome to our latest Money Show Money Masters podcast segment. I'm Mike Larson, Editor-in-Chief with Money Show, and today I'm speaking with Barry Riddles, founder and CIO at Riddles Wealth Management. Barry, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. You know, I'm really glad we could just like take a few minutes out of panicking about bankrupt Chinese developers and chat here on, on the market. So, you know, it seems like one of those days where everybody just wants to dump stocks. You know, if you're thinking um, long term, if you're investing because you're either thinking about retirement or generational wealth transfer or even philanthropy, what happens on a random Friday in China really is just not relevant to your your long term plans. Uh, how often are the headlines screaming? Um, a recession is coming. We've been hearing that for two years. Now, the Fed will never get inflation under control. I can make an argument that inflation came down regardless of what the Fed did. And what is this, the third, fourth, fifth scare about China over the past couple of years? They're going to sell all our <laughs> bonds. OK, there's not yep. enough bonds to go around. Happy to be a buyer. Um, they're, they're, they're building these ghost cities. Yeah, we know about that. It's already in the, in the price. Like every time there's another, uh, remember when some of the Chinese technology CEOs sort of disappeared from view for a while, <laughs> uh, this is it. This is the end of the China tech set. Uh, the, the clickbait stuff is entertaining, but it's not how we manage assets and it's not how individuals should manage their own assets. You know, absolutely right. And I, I know behavioral finance has always been a big area of interest for you. So I was going to ask, you know, when you see something like this unfolding here, I mean, what are the lessons that investors can take away every time one of these bouts of mini panic seems to come out of nowhere? So first, if there were no panic, if it, if it was easy to hold stuff, if there were no drawdowns, that's called risk-free returns. And, and that's pretty much what you get from the 10-year treasury, which is all the way up to 4%. Ooh, 4% <laughs> with inflation at 3%. Not a great, not a great return. You're paid, and, and we spend a lot of time educating clients on this. Investors are paid to ride out the difficult times. You're paid because it's not easy to just buy and hold. You're paid uh, a premium, the, the market premium, is because you're constantly tempted by the news flow to dump stocks and the people who don't dump stocks. And uh, the, the seminal example is Warren Buffett uh, because of his age, right? He, he's the typical person has a 30 to 40 year investment horizon. You know, you start working in your 20s. Even if you have a 401k, you're putting a little money away. Really, that starts to compound, but you really aren't adding a lot the typical person until their 40s yeah. and 50s. And by the time they're mid 60s or 70s, they're retired. Buffett started young, 90, still still investing, late 80s, still investing. And um, he's had, you know, 70 years to compound. And you really see the advantage of ignoring the, the noise. One last caveat, Ed Yardini puts out this thing every year News and Review, and it's the just a booklet of all the headlines from the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Washington Post, Barron's, you, you name it. And with a little bit of time, you realize how completely wrong the headlines are. They're always hair on fire. It's always some. There's always a reason to sell. There's always some reason to panic about. And when you thumb through this book, I usually keep one on my desk. I don't. I don't see it handy. Um, when you thumb through this book that comes out quarterly and once a year, it's so laughable that, wait, people sold because of this? And they, they sold at the end of 2022 because there was a recession coming? I mean, it's just so silly. News is old yep. and it's already in prices, right? The editor at the Wall Street Journal is simply not more in tune with what's going on with prices than the entire market. Unless it's like a genuinely new thing that was wholly unknown to every market participant, the odds are it's mostly already reflected in price. You know, you mentioned at a presentation you did for us earlier this year how our brains are sort of wired to interfere with successful investing. And there was a couple of points you made about behavioral economics and risk aversion there. And maybe you want to explore that for a minute or two. Sure. I mean, think about uh, evolutionary biology and the full history of. Uh, humans have only been around for, depending on which anthropologist you want to believe, a quarter million, a half a million, but very human-like 
uh, or pre-humans have been around for a few million years. And when you think about how evolution works, there's a series of forks and the most successful, most adaptable fork that provides an advantage to to any given creature tends to get uh, th those people hang around. So yeah. uh, one of my favorite examples is pattern recognition. Two people are walking next to uh, a, a field and one of them thinks they see something striped and they jump out of the way. And the other person kind of shrugs it off and ignores it. Or there's a stick on the ground that looks like a snake. And one person has a reaction and I uh, pardon the gross oversimplification <laughs> at a certain point in the history of humanity, one of those things was a snake and the person that ignored it, well, they got removed from the gene pool if it was a poisonous snake or some sort of uh, some sort of predator like a, a lion or a tiger. Old joke, two guys are in the woods, they see a lion, one of them stops and starts tying his sneaker and the other one says, what are you doing? You can't outrun a lion. And he says, I don't have to outrun the lion, I just have to outrun you. <laughs> and, you know, there's a lot of biological truth in that. Um, so we we have this wetware, we have this set of um, responses to stimuli as as human beings that developed uh, over you know millennia and it was designed to keep you alive and pass your genes along in a very challenging uh, environment. And whoever had the most adaptable wetware, whoever was able to respond to the threats and pass on their genes to their progeny, well, that's the baggage we're all born with. And so things that worked great on the savanna, they don't really work well in capital <laughs> markets. Responding immediately, thinking fast in Danny Kahneman's terms, keeps you alive. Yeah. But that doesn't help you select which of these muni bonds are going to do best for my financial needs, where I live and, and what my goals are. So sometimes you have to think slow and you have to really figure it out. Behavioral finance shows us all the, the ways our brains trick us into, in its attempt to keep us alive, make us perhaps not the best investors in the world. Yeah. Yeah, that's great advice, you know, especially in the long term. But I, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about the market environment. I mean, I know you don't want to throw your prognosticators hat on out there, but you did have a piece in Business Week where you, you actually, you know, tongue in cheek, congratulated the Fed and said, hey, you beat inflation and avoided recession. Congratulations. Right. Uh, what was your message in that piece? And, you know, do you think that that's ultimately what's going on out there? So there's an argument to be made that unlike the 1970s, where you had systemic inflation, wage spirals, oil embargoes, very powerful labor unions. I could go on and on with all the, the issues that were around in the 1970s. Think about what we had in the United States for the past, you know, since the great financial crisis. For more than a decade, you had rates at zero and didn't cause inflation. If, if rates don't cause inflation at zero, uh, why are you raising rates thinking it'll stop inflation? What happened in, in between that decade plus long period of, of ZERP and QE, you had the pandemic, you had the lockdown, you had people stuck in their house for a year or two, um, kids working from uh, going to school from home, parents at home. And on top of that, we had the biggest fiscal stimulus in history. CARES Act won, the first one under President Trump, $2 trillion. It was 10% of GDP. Unprecedented. <laughs> the only thing that you could look at that's even close is World War II and that wasn't pure stimulus. That was, you know, ramping up the war machine to fight against the Nazis. Um, so CARES Act one under Trump, two trillion. CARES Act two under Trump, about nine hundred billion. CARES Act three under Obama, another near trillion. So let's round that up to four trillion. Add in uh, the things that we're seeing over the next decade. So the infrastructure bill is a couple of trillion dollars that's spread out over 10 years. The Semiconductor um, Act is another giant stimulus that's also over the next decade. And then the Inflation Reduction Act is putting yeah. more money. So even though most of the CARES Act pig is through the Python, you still have this stimulative fiscal setup. So, so I think the Fed is kind of delusional, focusing on a 2% inf uh, inflation rate. When they were at zero, when we had a very subpar recovery for the first, 
I don't know, five, six, seven years of the post-financial crisis, subpar GDP, weak job creation, no job gains, poor consumer spending. Hey, hey, it was clear a little fiscal stimulus would have goosed the economy. We had a massive fiscal st stimulus and it goosed the economy. And now the Fed is still talking about a 2% inflation rate. Uh, FOMC, I got a little secret for you. That era is over. You're in a new era, the post-pandemic fiscal, not monetary era. And you should think about a three or a four percent uh, inflation target. P.S. Uh, Roger Ferguson, former vice chairman of the Federal Reserve, wrote a piece recently explaining where the two percent target came from. You might think it's the result of some academic research or some work that the Federal Reserve did on its own. It turns out that it's an offhand comment said in the 1980s on a television interview in New Zealand. <laughs> it has literally I wish I was making that up. You know, the <laughs> difference between truth and fiction is fiction has to make sense. Truth. Truth has no such obligation. It sounds ridiculous. And the reason it sounds ridiculous is because it is ridiculous. So two percent is a round number. Shockingly, everybody seemed to have adopted it. There's just no you know, the 20 percent bull or bear market, that's a made up media number. I, I'm not a fan of it, yeah. but it's sort of become a standard and everybody at least uses it as a reference. I think it's idiotic and should be ignored also. But 2 percent is literally just completely off the cuff. Um, there have been people who have been arguing for 3 percent or 4 percent. I, I reference in that uh, in a post in that piece in Business Week. Uh, the NBER researcher, who's also a professor, I'm trying to remember where he's a professor, um, had had in 2013 suggested 4%. A bunch of other economists have suggested 3%. I don't know what the right number is, but 2% just seems silly, especially when you say, hey, when you had a post-financial crisis and there was no inflation, remember parts of the world uh, there was deflation and and interest rates had negative numbers on on sovereign bonds. Two percent was a big lift and we never got there. Yeah. Now it's a new world. You have to adapt. You have to change. The Fed is notoriously late in recognizing these things. That's great big picture analysis there. I, I'm glad we're able to cover a little bit about the Fed and the interest rate outlook. Let's shift in the time we have left to what that means for investors, right? I mean, what about alternatives? I listened to the interesting conversation you had with Ted Sides, uh, if I'm uh -huh. pronouncing his name right, about- Ted you know, Cedis, yeah. Ted Cedis, excuse me. You know, outside of the 60-40 world, which famously failed in 2022, what can investors do in the, this new world, this new economic and rate environment that we're in? So let me just uh, go to first principles and correct a mistake statement you just made. Um, the last time stocks and bonds were both down double digits together in the same year was 1981. And then in 2022, after a 40 year bull market where bonds did nothing but go up as yields went down, eventually this too shall pass. And that ended. So 60 40 in 2022. Hey, it had a bad year, but it didn't fail. It did what it's supposed to do. It gave you diversification. Happened to be that rising rates had an impact on a stock market that had screamed higher. Yeah. A quick reminder, March 2020 till the end of the year, the S&P was up 68 percent. And then the following year was up nearly 30 percent. What, what were we down? 19 percent in 2022. You, you can't expect those sort of rates to continue. And in the fourth quarter of 21, I, I do a quarterly call for clients explaining the state of the world. Um, it's clients only. And one of the things I said in Q421 was, hey, I don't know when this is going to end, but I can guarantee you it will end eventually. And after the two years that we just enjoyed coming back from the pandemic in 20 and then the follow up year in 21, lower your expectations. Yeah. When stocks have gone this far, this fast, we know over long periods of time, you should expect eight to nine percent from the S&P, including dividends. And when you're getting 14 percent and then this year, 30 percent at the end of uh, 21, expect a little sideways action or some downward action. P.S. I have no idea when that was going to start, I said, but it's out there. And then, you know, just dumb luck. It happened to be that year. That said, everybody has to understand what they want from the markets. There's, there's an old joke. Um, the stock market is a bad place to figure out who you are. Understand who you are and what you want for markets. So for some people, hey, I just want to stay ahead of inflation and I want to make sure 
that my assets grow to the point where I don't have to worry about fill in the blank, uh, retirement, taking care of my kids, what, whatever it happens to yeah. be. The, the game of how can I beat the stock market, um, for most people, it, it doesn't really work out because, you know, it, it, to me, the, the outperformers are the exceptions that prove the rule. You look at Peter Lynch, you look at Warren Buffett, you go down the list um, uh, uh, of the greatest fund managers in history, the greatest stock pickers in history. There's a couple of dozen out of, I know there's 400,000 Bloomberg terminals, <laughs> and then there's another few million traders to say nothing of the crazy, you know, meme traders we saw during the lockdown. It's very similar to saying this guy, LeBron James is, is pretty good. I, I think I could play pro ball. I, I got a decent outside shot to, to compete with those people. You're just competing at a level um, a Michael Jordan like level. And so for the average person looking at the market, it shouldn't be about what can I do to beat the market? It's what can I do to obtain the goals that will bring me life satisfaction? So if that means you want to go outside of the 60, 40, because you think you need a higher return, I'm not saying a market beating return, but you need a higher return. Um, there are lots of options out there. You just have to be a little careful with everything that gets too popular. Probably yeah. my favorite example was in the middle of 2021 was peak money flows into private credit, right? Remember for a long time, you weren't getting anything in the public market. You're getting very little rate, um, very little yield. The 10 year was under 2%. Mm -hmm. um, and so people looked elsewhere. Look, it, it, if you're okay with the illiquidity, um, the fact that you're locked up, if you're okay with other factors and you think that you can get a premium with a little more risk over what the market is offering, what the public markets are offering, and that's okay with you, then I don't have an issue with that. The, the single most important piece of advice about this comes from science fiction uh, writer Ted Sturgeon, who used to be asked all the time, why is so much science fiction garbage? And his answer was 90% of everything is crap. <laughs> so if you look at, at the typical science fiction, it's junk. Look at the top 10%. The same is even more true when it comes to mutual funds, venture capital, hedge fund, private equity, and private credit. Make sure you're not investing in all the people who plowed into that space and don't have a long-term track record and haven't shown the ability to, to say, here's our target and here's what we're going to do. Um, we, we see this time and again, my, my favorite quote in the space comes from Jim Chanos, mm -hmm. who's been running Kinecos Associates for almost 40 years. And he said when he launched the fund in the 1980s, there were 500 hedge funds and they all created alpha. Today, there's 11,000 hedge funds and 500 of them generate alpha. So if you're not in the best of the funds, um, you're really paying a lot for a mediocre performance. And that doesn't work well with me. So I'm, it's very nuanced argument, Yeah. but essentially it's, Hey, if you can get into one of the best shops out there, one of the best funds, and they have a track record of, you know, generating, uh, when the, when the 10 year is at 4%, they're generating 7% or 8%. The, the caveat is you have to be locked up for five years or seven years. Go ahead. That that's perfectly fine. But don't assume that every PE pitch that you look at it or every private credit pitch you look at is going to meet those needs. The, the definition um, uh, of volatility is that when you fail to generate your expected returns and it, it's much harder. I'm making it sound simple. Hey, just <laughs> buy into the best fund. Um, it's really, really hard, at least when it comes to the public markets. Uh, you could do well. And when it comes to fixed income, if you want, you know, active seems to lag on the equity side, but active definitely generates value on the fixed income side. Right. Because think yeah. about it. There's thirty five hundred stocks. There's a million, literally a million bonds. And the way fixed income generates their um, outperformance is a they cut out anything they think uh, is is garbage. They would typically eliminate anything that they think isn't paying you sufficiently for the risk they're asking you to assume. And then lastly, they could slide around with duration. We, we lowered our duration 
um, I want to say end of 21, early 22. And we still, you know, had a drawdown in fixed income, but it wasn't nearly as bad as uh, what, what the typical, what the Barclay Ag had a drawdown. And now, given that we're over 4%, coming up on 4.3% on the 10 year, yep. if you're in really short term bonds, the risk is at some point. So, what are the two risks with bonds? Well, either yields will go up or yields will go down. After getting nothing for for forever, if you can lock in four and a quarter, four and a half, I think corporates are five percent. Then you should really think about that. The risk is maybe it goes to five and a half, six percent on the corporates, or it goes back down to two and a half, three percent. And after so long without it, without yield, now seems to be a decent time to start legging into um, higher yielding quality investment grade fixed income. Again, great take there. Appreciate you taking some of the theory and bringing it down to what people can do. Uh, last question, so I don't take up too much of your time. You know, we're about two and a half months out from the money show in Orlando and glad you're going to be speaking there. Any sneak peek or any hint you want to maybe share about what you'll be talking about there? Sure. I, I did an early uh, draft of something that I, I shared at, at the Brooklyn Money Show, that which was a sort of much smaller room, much, much more private um, presentation. And um, I've spent some time sort of uh, up updating that and and again, trying to find real life examples that are instructive to the high net worth investor. And there's this fantastic story that was in the Financial Times a couple of months ago. And back to what I said earlier, the difference between truth and fiction is uh, fiction has to make sense. Truth, truth has no such restrictions on it. <laughs> Um, there's a family. It's a fantastic story of a family who comes to the United States uh, escaping Nazi Germany and uh, wildly successful build an oil business. It gets sold. It gets sold again. And and the company and the founders and the family go through a series of ridiculous, almost hilarious missteps, uh, first with Enron, then with Bernie Madoff, then with FTX. <laughs> If it wasn't true, you would say, <laughs> bullshit. No, that, that couldn't happen to anybody. That's just so, that's ridiculous. You're making it up. But it's real. The story is fascinating. And the lessons for investors, it's not just don't give your money away to people who are criminals. Obviously, that that's, um, that's a little too uh, obvious. It turns out when you look at how high net worth or ultra high net worth families run into trouble, Turns out there's only three ways it happens. They lose the money themselves. They trust the money to somebody who legitimately underperforms or loses the money for them, or, or they you know, trust somebody who steals it from them. <laughs> and those three topics are surprisingly easy, uh, surprisingly common, but also surprisingly easy to avoid if you just take these three or four steps. And it's not a pitch, give your money to us and we'll make sure it doesn't happen. It's like, our whole business model is you can do this yourself. And if one or two of you don't want to bother, we're available. But this are simple things that you can do. I'm fond of saying investing is simple but hard. You know, knowing what you need to do is not that complicated. Doing it, it's really difficult because your instincts are always going to lead you astray. And you have to be very self-aware when one of those instincts are are popping up and sending you in the wrong direction. Thank you so much, Barry. I do appreciate your time. And thank you all for watching. Um, if you want to get uh, hear some more from Barry, more of his market intelligence and the rest of that story, do check out the Money Show Traders Expo Orlando. It's scheduled for October 29th to 31st at the Omni Orlando Resort. You can find out more in the link in the description below. One last thing, if you did enjoy this video or learn something new, uh, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe to get all of the content we do here for on the Money Show YouTube page. Barry, thanks again so much for your time. Thank you for having me.